Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you today to What's in Deegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, well, friend, the answer is always going to be comic books. I pick up a stack of comic books from around my domain. We go through them on the camera here for your, well, hopefully your entertainment, possibly your education, perhaps even your edification, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself there. Uh, in any event, the first thing I want to do uh, before we get started here is to direct you in the direction of my Patreon. Uh, tons of stuff on there to download if you like this show, if you like what I do, if you want to support what I do and want to see more of it, that's that's where you go. There's tons of stuff there for you to download. Uh, but moving past that, uh, Oh, there we are. I was, I was literally just going to tell them what you were up to, and I look down at him, and he, he jumps up at me. Uh, is this going to be a problem? I was just throwing the ball around with him. He can't say that I wasn't just playing with him, although perhaps that's what the problem is. I was just playing with him. Well, you sat down. You signaled your disinterest in the activity by sitting down. Oh, well. Let's see how far we can go. With X-Force here. Uh, this is uh, January 1995. So this is, this is right before uh, the Age of Apocalypse. Uh, because Age of Apocalypse hits in the first quarter of 95. So this was... Uh, the books... Uh, they knew it was coming, it was their plan. So they, they used the, the months leading up to the Age of Apocalypse to clear, or to clear a few decks or set things up. And I don't remember what was going on here. Tony Daniel, he drew uh, a good amount of X-Force in this period. He was the artist on the title. Uh, there may be a couple other people in there for a few issues, but I think it was uh, Greg Capullo into Tony Daniel into Adam Polina, like I say, I might be forgetting something. But um, and then Jimmy Chung brings up the rear after Adam Polina, and I don't know who does it after Jimmy Chung. But that's a lot of good artists on this book over the course of its lengthy run. I don't, however, think uh, that it, that that Tony Daniel is drawing this. Who is drawing this? Because you can see in an instant that looks like Eminem, Earl No. Dodson, Dodson, early Dodson, although are you not going to give me? Yeah, Terry Dodson with Kevin Conrad. Always look back to see, uh, always interesting to look back and see these early uh, Terry Dodson jobs that don't have, um, don't have the inking that were, were so familiar. They work so well. They work so well together. What are you doing? What are you doing? We're talking about X-Force. We're talking about X-Force 42. We're talking about wrapping things up right before... Uh, this must be just like one or two months before they, they get ready for Age of Apocalypse. So they were, they were about to have a really good year, which is kind of funny because Marvel as a whole did not have a really good year uh, in 1995. So the fact that they were doing fairly well for themselves when just about everyone else was uh, having to sell the furniture to keep the lights on. In hindsight, that they should maybe have looked into that a bit more before they, they gave them the keys to the company, but that's, you know, 30 years hindsight talking right there. Uh, but yeah. The x books still had good people drawing them in 1995, in 1994. You know, things were a little bit shaky. In 1992, going on to three, it took them a while. But by the mid-90s, it, it felt like they they had some swing in their step artistically. Uh, certainly, that's when they got Joe Matarera. Uh, Carlos Pacheco did a surprising amount. Uh, surprisingly, you know, decent chunk of X-Men there in the 90s. Not just the Bishop Limited Series. So, yeah, this is something to do with 
the White Queen, and this it, since this is right before uh, Age of Apocalypse, this is right after the launch of uh, Generation X, meaning, yeah, she's still wearing the, the specific design that uh, Chris Piccolo did in advance of the, the first uh, set of issues there. Now, of course, as the book went on, it turned out to be a bit more of a plain clothes book for, for most of its run, which was actually kind of interesting in hindsight. Ah, uh, well, you know, it seems like they change her clothes all the time now. Uh, she's never been my, never been my favorite character. I like Generation X. It was a great book. I like this. Well, see, that's the thing. I was about to say, I like the book, except for the fact that I don't care for Banshee that much, and I'm often openly antipathetic towards Emma Frost, but I like the kids well enough. So we're interacting with them because there's a natural connection between the book. He's the mentor in Generation X. She's she's in X-Force. And nothing really has... Uh, I hate to say it, but I mean, he, he was dead for a decade, I think. Uh, and she's not dead. She just never gets used for anything. And that's weird considering the fact that she was a, wasn't just big in X-Force, but she was one of only a couple supporting characters that Deadpool started with, and she never really appears in the book anymore. They ever asked me to write Deadpool. That's, that's first on my list, I'll tell you. Oh, smoking one of those Irish pipes. I was going to say, smoking one of those Irish pipes that you can buy in the tourist kiosk, because you have to remember they're from Ireland. They're Irish characters, as if the Claremont accents weren't enough. Now, you know, you're supposed to turn the page and find uh, Emma has a bit of a waspy accent, but that's possibly a little bit harder to convey. Fabian Nisi, he's not a bad writer. Not necessarily a great dialogue, man. But man, I, his new warriors, absolutely. Recommend, without hesitation, love that book. Two, two years of solid uh, early Mark Bagley, him just getting his legs under him and figuring out uh, not how to draw a comic book, because he sort of already knows how, but how to draw a good comic book. How to draw a good comic book on that schedule. New Warriors, especially the first few years, even after Bagley leaves, it's a good book. And a huge part of that, a huge part of that is down to Fabian DCs, and of course, you know, like every good thing, they tried to, they, they killed it, they uh, milked it, they put out six different crossovers with tie-ins that there wasn't an audience for. All the will in the world wasn't going to get you an audience for, for Nova in 1994. And I, I bought a couple issues because they tied into the story, but that was sort of about when I started to back out of New Warriors, too, because something that I'd really liked just got stretched out like taffy, and that's kind of what happened at the time. Now, it just so happened when they did it to the X-Men, the X-Men could actually support all that uh, ancillary stuff. Rather, sometimes to the company's... Uh, what are you doing? He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's playing with his scratch pad. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Don't let me interrupt you. When he actually plays with a toy that I get him, well, that's what makes it all worth it. I'm just passing by these wonderful, uh, this must have been the last or near the last product cycle for the, the Sega Genesis. They were on to the next generation uh, very soon. Sega Saturn's just around the corner. Uh, but another round for Lethal Enforcers with an Old West theme. Didn't the first one rather, uh, wasn't that the one that had the the, the gun in the... In the uh, comic book ad? I want to say. I'm not going to look it up. Uh, so they're dealing with the fact that, you know, that's uh, James Proudstar. He has a really traumatic life. He's lost just about everyone in his life from his brother with the X-Men to uh, his tribe. They were killed like literally like 
right at the end of the first volume of New Mutants. It's mentioned. And then it's never, they don't really run to get back to that subplot. And I'm sure, I'm sure it was resolved at some point. This may even be a part of that. I don't remember. But uh, they really didn't want to touch it. <laughs> it was not a plot line that they had any interest in. And the other, I was going to say, he lost his brother, he lost his tribe, and he lost his first team, which was the Hellions. And he blames her because everyone who had anything to do with the Hellions blames her. That's why she should never have been let to, allowed to join the X-Men. I'm sorry, I will still. That is a hill. That is a hill for me. I'm I'm sorry. If you read the fires, if you read her her history with Firestar, you do not let this woman near any position of authority, or she will burn your horse barn down. I have read that. I know. Got to get all the Emma Frost fans coming down on my case. Well, I'm sorry. I've been reading the. I've been reading the X-Men for a very long time. I can afford to think that some of the characters are schmucks. The X-Men is full of schmucks. I don't really like a lot of the X-Men. If, if I had to share a car ride with most of them, I would have a problem. Imagine being in a car for 14 hours solid with... Uh, any of them. Any of them. Absolute terrible company, I'm certain. And yet their adventures are often quite, quite entertaining. You know, that's the joy of fiction. Uh, oh, so we're back at the Massachusetts Academy. And years later, I lived in the area that the Massachusetts Academy, I think, um, Western Massachusetts, and it, it is a beautiful country. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to try to tell you. I didn't always get, around, get along with all the people in it, but it was beautiful. Perfect climate. Perfect climate, other than the whole swampy summers. Never got used to that. Uh, can't deal with the humidity. But they're mutants. They don't have to worry about humidity. So, yeah, I mean, this was a good, oh, this was a good mix of characters. People like these guys. And of course, as was often the case, uh, nothing good happened to them after the run of their initial uh, series. I mean, you know, you can say that about all the X characters to a degree. I mean, poor Paige, she was just demolished in the Chuck Austin run. Just threw, the, threw a wonderful character away, practically, with some of the, the worst plotting of that series. Now, you know, Tabitha, she's actually done pretty well. If you have not read The Exterminators, The Exterminators is a rare, recent X-Men book that gets my 100% unqualified recommendation. It's a great book. It's a fantastic time. It's funny. She's great in it. She showed up every now and again. But, you know, a character who sometimes is interesting and a lot of the times just sits in the background. And she actually has shown up a lot more than I would have guessed based upon the first couple years of this book when her, her plot lines just dragged everything down. And to this day, I read them. I like the book. But don't ask me to explain what, what her origin is. I'm not going to be able to do that with a gun to my head. And I'm glad that for the most part, I, I thought that they had just were putting that in the past, but then the... Penance form appeared in Uncanny Avengers, which I bought because it had Rogue in it. And I was confused, but not enough to figure out. Not enough to go back and figure it out. Jubilee, there's a, there's a character who's, who isn't the same character anymore. They, they changed her character in a way that I actually think most people are cool with. I've never heard anyone complain about her becoming a mother. It gave her a direction of sorts for the stories that wanted to use her. Uh, she, she went through a period in the early 2000s. No one was doing anything with her, so it seemed like she just sort of fell through the cracks for a while. Uh, she was a vampire for a while, too. What are you doing? No. 
some little scamp just ripped a plug out of the phone. So congratulations, he's learning technology. You know, every time I see a picture online of someone teaching their cat to use a screen, I just think to myself, is it a good idea to give these, these monsters any understanding of human technology? No, that is not a good idea in any way. Hmm. Pitfall, the Mayan adventure. Do they still make Pitfall games? Pitfall, or something very much like Pitfall, was the only uh, program, the only game program on the early computers that they began using in elementary schools in the 80s and the early, I think the early 90s. I remember seeing so many games of Pitfall and I could never get the hang of the controls myself. So there's some sort of intense conversation. I'm sure it's 100% on character, significant. Fabian Nicias is in charge. He always had a good hand for characterization. Uh, I mean, that's, that was the, why New Warriors worked as well as it did. We love those characters. He made them, you know, really come alive. And to a degree, you know, he, he did that kind of work on this book as well. Oh, see, there we go. That's, uh, you're wondering who this funky mutant is. Well, we're not telling you, so you're just going to have to guess. Oh, they're being cute about it. Keep it parked right here for the December edition of x Facts, And sometime around here, um, the issue of Wizards should be hitting stands. It's announcing that all the X-Books are being canceled. Uh, which, let me tell you something, it hit. It's the stupidest thing in hindsight. I knew it was a, a put-on of some kind, but it was still a shocking put-on. What the heck could be big enough, to be fair? You know, the story was actually was actually pretty big, and a lot of people liked it, and I really liked it. And it was it basically destroyed the line. <laughs> Being able to actually do a good story like that one time that people really liked doomed them for at least the rest of the decade to try and chase that. <sighs> Wasn't expecting to see a Howard Chaikin riff like that in the middle of X-Force, but there you go. That's interesting. Ahead of its time. Oh, that's nice. You know, early Dotson was, was good. Early Dotson knew how uh, to draw a comic book. Definitely. Uh, there's a reason why I get his very early, early stuff mixed up with m &N's early stuff, because they both have a very uh, rounded feel that, you know, clearly they get from Hughes and uh, McGuire, I'd say, as well, with some Michael Golden in there. But definitely people who um, understand physiology as, uh, you know, physiognomy as the backbone of what they do. I did a review uh, last year that was sort of a rundown of that school of art. I'm putting it up on the screen right now so you can check it out. A Lie of the Mind, Fabian Nicias, Terry Dodds, and Kevin Conrad. All right. Next issue, the search for Bobby DaCosta continues as the MLF's locus appears. Uh, so, so they were still dribbling out characters from the first part of the decade. They really created a lot of characters in the first couple years of the 90s, and then they spent the rest of the decade just figuring out what to do with all the randos who had appeared uh, in the background of a Rob Liefeld comic book at some point. And they've actually gotten interesting, uh, some of them. Some of them still, you know, has there been a great forearm story? I don't know, maybe there was in the Krakoa years. Uh, so, yes, I think I've spoken about Maximum Carnage before. Never could defeat it, because a claim... In their infinite wisdom, they chose not to introduce any kind of save function. No, this was done in one. You sit down, you beat every level in one sitting, or you don't beat this game. I couldn't do it. I had trouble clearing the intermediate rounds. My friends, who I ended up loaning it around to, who were much better at video games than I, no one I know was ever able to beat this. No, man, you'd have to go in shifts. <laughs> 
Oh, more of these clear cells. They just, did they still sell that stuff? It just dries you out. It just dries you out so terribly. All right, I got some fun. World's Finest, number 287. Uh, so this is 80, what is this, 83? Yeah, January 83, so tail end of 82 this came out. And this was a couple years into DC's very conscious attempt to improve their lots. They had a very, very rough late 70s. The books looked bad. There was almost nothing worth reading. They just looked listless on the shelves. And they entered the 80s really feeling sorry for themselves, almost. You know, Roy Thomas was over from Marvel and writing All-Star Squadron. That was, that was a hit for them. That's the level they were at. But to their credit, they spent the next decade crawling out of that hole. And by the time uh, the, the 80s were over, people weren't talking about DC like that anymore. No, DC was where they did stuff like Dark Knight. Yeah, Watchmen. All that good stuff, Camelot 3000. It wasn't the company that was running uh, the publishing line to death in the 70s. Look up the DC implosion sometime. One of the worst course corrections you've ever seen in this industry. Uh, they tried out a number of new things that were just completely slaughtered. It was a big new initiative, DC explosion, and then it None of those new books worked, or I, I don't think more than, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they, they just had to cancel a bunch of new books right out of the gate. And it was, it was a horrendous embarrassment. It was, it was a wound that they took into the 80s. But, you know, part of it was they started hiring people who had been working at Marvel and were finally sick of Jim Shooter. That, that was a big part of it. You know, Frank Miller didn't want to do Ronan with Epic. For whatever reason, he didn't. He came back later to do Electra Assassin, but he didn't own Electra Assassin because he doesn't own Electra. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Why do I own this comic, you ask? It's got a Rich Buckler and Romeo Tango cover. You know, it's not the most, not the most exciting cover, if we can be honest. But, Trevor Von Eden, yep, yep. I knew there was a reason I had this. Trevor Von Eden. I went through that thing a few years back where I just bought every Trevor Von Eden I could find. I'm still, you know, looking for Trevor Von Eden. I don't have, there's a ton of it. Uh, I just don't get to travel to comic book stores as often as I'd like. Ooh, Zagnut. Don't see those much anymore. Still see Clark bars sometimes. Milk duds. You get stuck in your teeth. I like caramel. Those those always get stuck in your teeth. Within my heart, the enemy. So this is written by Carrie Burkett. Marv Wolfman, editor. What was I saying about people who didn't want to be over at uh, Marvel? But there's Lynn Varley. Uh, Lynn Varley and Trevor Von Eden worked together a lot before uh, Lynn Varley worked together a lot with uh, Miller. He was, in fact, this came up in the article I wrote a few months ago, uh, Trevor Von Eden was Frank Miller's first pick for year one, which is a real, real trip. Because you know, he did, Trevor Von Eden would have drawn the hell out of that. But it would have been a completely different book. There's, you know, that's a whole what if that we'll never have to understand because the version we have is Pretty spectacular in and of itself. It doesn't read like someone who was Miller's second pick to do the drawing. So, uh, yeah, World's Finest starring Superman and Batman. Within my heart, the enemy. So, yeah, just one look. All you got to do is take one look, and you see right there Trevor Von Eden. Look at that. Look at this. One panel. This one panel. Oh, my goodness, look at this. Folks, sometimes Trevor Von Eden is, is one of a handful of artists who really can 
just render me completely speechless. Because on one level, it's not like he's a magician. A lot of what he does is actually quite simple once you understand it, break it down. And yet it's just so, so perfectly done. He is, uh, you know, he was the toth of his generation. I shouldn't say was, he's not dead, he just doesn't work very often anymore. Oh my goodness, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. A good colorist could produce breathtaking effects on even this awful newsprint with the four color process. People who really put themselves into trying to get something out of it, like Lynn Varley. My goodness. Oh, and what was I just saying, Camelot 3000? It was foretold that England's, England's greatest champion will return in her hour, the hour of her greatest need. It is the year 3000, that time has come. I love Camelot 3000. If anyone thinks I'm being sly, snide or dismissive, I may rib it a little bit because the fact is that this series was quite hyped in its time. And it has fallen off a little bit in critical esteem because, you know, what came after, this wasn't necessarily something that was going to get people ex that excited in a world that it, that it seen, you know, Dark Knight. It was an evolutionary step in a certain type of comic, and it's 12 issues drawn by Brian Bolland. Admittedly, he's not inking them, and the first time you find that out, eh, you know, there's a little bit of disappointment. Obviously, Camelot 3000 would be a better comic book if Brian Bolland could have drawn and, and inked it. But the fact is, it would still be coming out today had they done that. It is a decent inking job. It might have done Ball and more good to work with an inker. An inker. What do I know? Trevor Von Eden, he does not need any inker here. Look at this. Look at this. Just effortlessly. This is like Every panel, just about, seems to show a different kind of possibility for the art for a comic book like this. New directions, you know, just about every, every panel. And you see some of the later Miller. Definitely you see some of the later Miller here. I think Bernie Wrightson as well took something from Trevor Von Eden. If you look at their Batman, their, their Batman are very similar. He was an influence on just about everyone who ever saw. Because, oh my goodness, just look at this. I have no idea. Do not ask me what's going on in this comic book. Couldn't tell you. Uh, if I were reviewing it for the show, I would sit down and read it. But... I'm just sharing it with you good people. So we're, we're just looking at the pretty pictures. My goodness. And here's just a page of a dude sitting in a darkened room. As compelling as, you know, Gene Colan could do. Not afraid to just do this simple spotted black against a primary color. There's an, he does an issue of uh, Vigilante that's just all, almost all in silhouette. Not almost all, but a great deal on silhouette. Everything. There's no such thing as a Trevor Von Eden comic book. It isn't a complete master class in, in the form. You know, he never drew much flash, but his flash looks perfect. That's as on model and uh, interesting as the flash has ever looked, and he's in three panels of this issue of World's Finest. His characters have expression. He's not afraid to use negative space. Man, look at this. And you know, all this stuff that was trickling up that Miller was paying attention to, you know, that's how it trickled into the image generation. When you see layouts, 
you know, a lot of negative space with these tiny close-up panels. All the image guys did that a ton because it works. It pops. And this tiny little establishing shot at the bottom here. Ah, so, so excellent. Look at this. This is world's finest. This comic book does not deserve to look this good. I'm just going to go straight out and say that. No offense to Mr. Kerry Burkett, but the fact is, this is... And then he even does that thing which I associate almost exclusively with um, you know, like fanzine art. People who come up from the fanzine circuit will use different line weights, like this spotted black with, with tiny... Uh, hatching coming out of it. Gilbert Hernandez does it as well. Not a technique you see very many people do because it almost seems like uh, a very amateur technique and yet it can be really effective. And I'm sure it took less time than feathering that with a brush would have. <laughs> I can't say that for certain, but I'm pretty sure. My goodness, look at this. This is just... Look at this, this tiny little Batman down here. What are you doing? Anyway, I don't know where I was. I Before I was so rudely interrupted, we were sitting here gawking at the Trevor Von Eden. Oh, there's no backup, I don't think, either. Uh, World's Fine has had a backup a lot in this period. I think a lot of the DC line did. My goodness, look at this. A little bit of Joe Kubert there. That hand, just every every bit of it. Someone found the rattly ball on their own volition. Ooh, look at that. How can someone give us such a nice Superman on one page, then bam, excellent Batman on another page. It boggles the mind. And this was just a regular monthly comic book. He didn't draw it every month, but he drew it sometimes. He drew a few issues of World's Finest. David Mazzuccelli actually draws. Uh, his first DC work, I think, is a backup in World's Finest. I want to say I read that one on the TikTok channel because we're all about excavating the history. No, they're still selling the Sergeant Rock toys. Uh, that didn't last for too long. You know, no one was buying the comic book. If they'd had a cartoon, if there'd have been a Sergeant Rock cartoon, maybe they could have done something. But in 1993, G.I. Joe had a cartoon to sell it. My goodness, just look at this. Continued next issue. So they're fighting an evil witch. Okay, Batman and Superman fighting an evil witch of some kind. All right, I'll go with that. I don't recognize any of these names. There's a Charles D. Brown. Uh, oh, this is right after they had the... Uh, yeah, Green Arrow moved to his own backup slot in Detective. And those uh, have Trevor Von Eden art on them as well. For the, Oh, another page. I still don't know any of these people. <laughs> what are you doing? He's still after the front curtains. They were publishing a lot of digests in the early 80s. That form seemed to really blossom for both. For geese. Get out of there. Well, as I was so rudely interrupted, what I was about to say, based on these coming comics, is that DC was having a lot of success with the uh, digest format. And Marvel was putting out digests, too. For a good, you know, maybe a decade. And then towards the end of the 80s, uh, they tailed off and then the format just died. You know, except, of course, for the most you know, famous digest of all the Archie digests. But they paid a lot of money for that supermarket check stand real estate. And they weren't about to share it with other, with other comic book companies. That wasn't part of the deal, so... Uh, no one else really had much use for the Digest, although every now and again uh, someone does try a smaller 
than usual size reprint format. I think there's a line of Marvel Masterworks right now that's actually slightly smaller than size. Although, to be fair, all Silver Age stories are printed at smaller than size. That's a bit of an open scandal, but I think you've heard me about that before. Wonder Woman 300, written by Roy Thomas and drawn by seven of DC's most superb artists. Gene Colan, Keith Pollard, Keith Giffen, Dick Giordano, Jan Dersima, Rich Buckler, and Ross Andrew. That's a pretty good lineup. If I see that in a box, I'll probably get that. Uh, but because it's an anniversary edition, those are the ones that everyone's already taken out of the run when you find it in the box. The M Network. That's not a console, I remember. Oh, and this Lego Expert Builder series ad. All right. DC, where the action is. For that issue, at least. What else we got going here? All right. How about an issue of Savage Dragon? Issue 57. Completely at random. I have no idea what's going on in the book at this point. This is between when he leaves the Chicago police force and when he kills Overlord and the we get shifted over to a parallel universe. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Savage Dragon for you. That's that's what it's all about. So I know this guy, who was this guy? This was a weird, weird guy who thought he was Dragon? Was it? Eric Larson, everything. Chris Iliopoulos lettering. Uh, who has he got now for colors? Ruben... Oh, I, no. Oh, yeah. Ruben Rude, Abel Mountain, Bill Zindel, and Leah Rude. Colors. Josh Eichhorn. Choking hazard, small parts, not for children under six years of age. If you don't know the, the, the joke... Josh Icorn was apparently someone who was involved in the very first couple months of of working with Larson on something, and then just as you know, this completely obscure person who's passed out of having anything to do with the comic book long ago, except for the fact that they they just kept this running joke. I mean, apparently they must still be on good terms with the guy because they kept this running joke going still to this day on every new issue of Savage Dragon, just because every issue's done it. You have to have a stupid thing that you've done every issue, I guess. So, yeah, someone just died. There's someone wearing the... Oh, what is that guy? Over... Uh, oh, well, there you go. That's a Savage Dragon uh, opening splash, if ever there was one. Some guy getting... Fra... Fra whoosh. You missed me. Welcome back from the dead dragon. Oh, is the dragon... Is he dead and in this guy's mind or something? I don't remember. I hate to see you like this. I have no need for a hostage to dress yourself in that ridiculous dragon garb. So this is either the dragon in a human body or a human who thinks he's the dragon while the dragon's away. I don't remember. Oh, there's Kill Cat. He's this long-running... It, more or less a running gag. He was part of the, the Freak Force. I think he was part of the Freak Force team. But he continued to show up in Dragon because he's basically just a... He's just a dude who shows up to, to have something bad but funny happen to him. He has no idea what this is about, does he? He doesn't have a clue. I realize that, but do you think he knows what this is all about? <laughs> See, that's, that's Kill Cat for you. So this guy has this dragon costume that he puts on. To, apparently he still has the dragon's powers. Uh, but he's just a regular pink-skinned dude with a beard. I don't remember who this was. Overfiend? Not Overfiend. <laughs> Over something? I can't remember. He was the villain for the first couple years of Dragon. He uh, He was the head of the Vicious Circle, which was the organized crime group that bedeviled him for the first few years of the book, and I don't know if it appears much anymore, but uh, he dealt with the fallout of, of that. They were part of his rogues gallery, even once the scope of the book expanded. But man, this is a nice looking fight. Oh, 
of these chunky, chunky abstract brush lines he's doing there. And then you look, you look up close at like this uh, cape texture. It looks like he's um, using a fountain pen. Very uh, organic line. My goodness. I mean, this is great. I have no idea what the stakes are in this fight. Other than that that's a bad guy. This guy either is or thinks he's the dragon, so they're fighting. You've left yourself wide open. Time to die. Yeah, it's just... It's it's great. It's it's fantastic. And you can see, this is... Oh, I know I'm going to do it again. This is someone who has seen Fist of the North Star. Looks like he's about to put his hand into the dragon's chest there, which is something that happens like literally every six episodes on Fist of the North Star. It's a lethal injury for most people. Uh... Not apparently, if you understand the secrets of a Koto Shinkan. There you go. Man, look at that. All powerful armor, my ass, you're touched in the head. Come back here, you old piece of crap. Come back here. That's it, run, you pussy. <laughs> I chuckle because Dragon's the only book where people are still going to be, eh, you know, talking like salty people off the street. Speak to me, baby, please. Tell me you're in there. Tell me everything's going to be okay. I can't hear his voice in my head, Rita. Oh, so apparently, yeah, I guess Dragon's mind was... Okay, so his, his mind is floating around. There's Jennifer and... Oh, God, I can't remember her name. She grew... She, if you remember Mr. Glum, Mr. Glum ends up at her as her babysitter for a while, and then there's two different versions of hers, one which goes to another dimension with Mr. Glum. Not even a try. Oh, wow. Cadaver. I don't remember that guy at all. That's, that's the dragon. He fought so many different. And now they have, like, a wiki. There's a Savage Dragon wiki to, to keep track of it all. And, uh... It's actually come in handy for a few times <laughs> reading The Dragon. I've not read every issue of The Dragon. I missed a few over the years. Uh, and I think even if you had read every issue, he's just, there's so many dudes. So many dudes. It's up to like issue 269 or something. Do you know how many dudes that adds up to in like comic book speak? Savage Dragon Burke and Hitler's Brain Bird. Oh, yeah, because Hitler's brain was a supporting... Uh, well, it showed up a couple times, I think. It wasn't a supporting character. Augie de Blake. He still shows up online every now and again, doesn't he? I can't remember the last time I had any uh, conversation with him. Uh, yeah, you know, Dilbert spoofs were still au courant, I guess. Uh... Till next time I remain that third time offender in all of our hearts, the doc. Yeah, see, people wrote into this every month. Uh, look at this. Look at this. One, three, five, six, seven. Boom. There you go. You can't say the image guys didn't didn't have the pulse on. Their finger on the pulse of their fans. That was the, the success. You can't say these image guys didn't have their fingers on the pulse of their fans. And those that have survived this time, pretty much all of them, you know. Jim Lee's always been a little bit uh, more standoffish than the others, I think. I, I think a... Uh, much as I may be bemoan the lack of more Jim Lee drawn comics, he actually did draw a fair amount of comics. Still does draw comics every now and again, which is more than you can say for some of the people who started at Image. Of course, they can't all be Eric Larson, but hey, even Mark Silvestri still gets in the, th in the swing of things sometimes. Tom Rainey, uh, that's Bob Fingerman. Uh, those are the strings you see crossing in uh, a book like Savage Dragon. And here's a Megaton Man strip 
by Dandy Don Simpson. I think Megaton Man showed up in the back of Dragon a few times. Uh, I My Megaton Man stuff is all uh, spread out over years. I've never actually sat down and tried to make sense of anything that's happening in the franchise. <laughs> And here's Chris Eliopoulos' Desperate Times, which actually spawned its own comic book, which lasted, okay, I don't know how long it lasted. There's an ad for it on the back. <laughs> Not representative, necessarily, of the inside of the comic book. But, you know, that's the ad. It's, it's basically like this early comic book prototype of what you'd see in webcomics. Two dudes sitting around cracking jokes with a cracky, uh, with an animal sidekick, cracking wise. That's... Every, every webcomic from the first, like, ten years of webcomics right there. The platonic version of the form, we can say, in hindsight. And some of those actually grew up to be different things. Most of them are gone. I bought the, I bought when I, Desperate Times, when I saw it, I was into the dragon. I was, I was all bored. All right, we got a few more minutes. We got a couple more minutes. All right, one good turn deserves another. I mentioned Stuart Eminent earlier, and I just happened to have a Stuart Eminent book right on top of the stack there. This is, uh, yeah, that's him doing the cover. That's, oh my God, that's striking. Yeah, you know, he, I think he has said in interviews that I may be misremembering, but I think he said that he lingered too long on the Superman books. And I've heard him almost, almost, I think, express regret over working uh, as hard on, he does a graphic novel to wrap up his tenure called The End of the Century. It's absolutely gorgeous. The kind of book that I think the artist actively resents having puts as much work into, if I recall, uh, interviews I've read of his. Um, but everything he does, even from this point, absolutely gorgeous. You see here, he's writing and penciling. He can write just fine. Uh, you just, you know, he's not going to do the writing if he's not being paid to do it. Uh, Jose Marzan, Inker. Oh, and you got Randy Dubork on a dream sequence. All right, so I don't know who this guy, you know, it's Superman. Every month he's got to fight a raft of schmucks. I don't know who this guy is. Jinko! You know you're deep into the heart of it with Jinko. Oh, man, just look at how nice. He drew a great Lois. I think that's Lucy Lane. So, you know, this woman's doing something. There's our guy. If you want to read Superman, that's what you want to see. Very, very classically modeled Superman. Hello, Superman, where are you? I'm waiting. So he's calling out Superman. This guy's named Crazy Top. Okay. Oh, there's that dude from Tekken. I know nothing about Tekken. Played Street Fighter and... Mortal Kombat in their earliest incarnations. I know the gist of those. I know nothing about Tekken because I tapped out a PlayStation. I've never, never touched a PlayStation controller, but like twice in my life. I know, I'm square. I'm square. I acknowledge. Oh, look at that. That head turned upward, that difficult angle. And he gets it right, of course. And this three-quarter turn on Lucy Lane. Oh, my goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, Stuart Eminent. We do not appreciate Stuart Eminent enough. He is a fantastic artist. And I feel to a degree he was disserved by certain aspects of his career to date. He was good enough that he ended up doing a lot of big books, very popular runs of books that didn't end up having a lot of character to them. They were good because he drew them. Saving the world before bedtime. I remember the Powerpuff Girls. I love the, the original Powerpuff Girls. I love them. They were great. It seems a bit like lightning in the bottle. If you go back to the, the well on that one, maybe it's not going to be quite so charming as it is in the very beginning. Man, look at that. Look at this. Xeno Gears, this looks like a, is it JRPG? Is that how to use that phrase correctly? 
Xenogears. Only on PlayStation. Only from Squaresoft. Yeah, PlayStation. Like I say, man, we want comics to be big again. You gotta get PlayStation ads in them. You gotta have a thick book filled with video game ads and movie posters and role-playing game stuff. That's and that's how you sell comic books. We have decades of, of proof to back that up. Why we ever got out of that business? Uh, and I know that sounds like an odd thing to lament, but for the safety, you know, the, the safety and security of the long-term health of the American comics industry, they should have done anything they can, anything they could to remain a profitable ad buy for those industries. And the direct market pamphlet just wasn't that. But, you know, I'm, I'm a broken record, I know. You know, there's still time. It's not like the world's, you know, going up in a puff of smoke tomorrow. Well, well, there you go. What was I saying? He draws a very nice Lois line. And there's Lex doing something or other with Jimmy Olsen. There you go. Droid Works. Oh, so this is 99, so this is part of the... Uh, Phantom Menace ad, ad push. They were pushing out so much Star Wars stuff. Oh my goodness, look at this. Look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, Stuart Eminem. And he can do some cute little uh, comic strip in this uh, pamphlet. That's cute. Eventually he pairs his style down quite a bit. You know, by the time you get to next wave, he's practically minimal in some of his line work. Hey, Musashi, Brave Fencer, Brave Fencer Musashi, Bushido Blade. So you're putting out two games at the same time in the same ad with, with swords in them? Seems like you're, you're breaking up your, your sword demographic there. What do I know? Includes collector's CD with a playable demo of Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, there you go. Do they still do the correspondence courses? Kubert School produced a lot of good artists over the years. Still does, as far as I know. And there's uh, Lucy Lane with Ron Troop, who was a he was a great supporting character. He was a great guy. Whatever happened to him? He just uh, this whole this whole supporting cast in this period was really well drawn. And I think that uh, when people talk fondly about that this period, I think the fact that all of the supporting cast really got the chance to breathe, to shine, to establish themselves. They're meeting his parents, apparently. Which, you know, I guess was uh, enough to be a plot line in a Superman comic book in the late 90s. Uh, oh man, look at that angry Lois down there. <laughs> TV in the elevator. Well, she's complaining that everyone's using computers at the new... At the, that's interesting. This CGI... Uh, it, I say CGI, but it would have... Uh, what is that? What would we have called it at the time? Like uh, the DOS aesthetic? So Superman's still fighting that schmuck. Man, I'm just loving every different Lois Lane expression. She's so expressive. Man, lots of people are drawn Superman. But I think Stuart Eminent is in the top rank of Lois Lane artists. If you ask me. Uh oh, there you go. So, oh, I guess this isn't really. Oh, it must not be Kryptonite. Oh, well, Superman is here. Oh, is this Superman for the N64? Oh, man. <laughs> Notoriously one of the worst video games that has ever been. Uh, I'm sure that there are any number of videos on this very same platform if you want to get with the chuckles on that one. Oh, there's uh, um, Maggie Sawyer. That's her name. Eventually, she would sort of move over to the Batman books because she became a Batwoman supporting character. 
but she was a Superman uh, supporting character for the, for the 90s. Like I say, a lot of good characters used in this period. Man, look at this. How can you see this and not want her him to draw a Lois Lane comic book? How good would that look? Look at this. This is a giant size issue, by the way. So in uh, late 1998, when this book shipped, uh, double-sized uh, issue 750 of Action Comics, 295. My goodness. Yeah, I really, you know, even if I was losing my patience with the books at this time, maybe the reason it took me a long time to completely wean myself was that week in and week out, they were still, they could still look very good. Oh, this is after the Lost in Space movie. I remember being rather decent. It's the only, I think it's the only iteration of Lost in Space I've ever spent any time watching. <laughs> Uh, so this is a dream sequence of some kind, drawn by someone else. Was oh, this just some random dude having a dream about Sp uh, Spider-Man, Superman? Oh no, it's Superman having a weird dream. Oh, it was, that's his boss. I didn't recognize because it's, it's a different artist. That's his boss at the paper, I guess. Maybe you're more affected by losing your job than you thought. Yeah, Superman was doing the. Uh, getting laid off from reporting in the late 90s. So, you know, they were, they were with the program as far as that goes. Of course, finding something for Clark Kent to do in 2024, I think, uh, takes a bit more... Uh, a bit more imagination, unless you want to write him as a columnist. <laughs> Look, I'm on Game Boy Camera. Do tricks with picks. Geek Tronica, well, there you go. Was there a bullpen, bull, not bullpen balloons, but you know, whatever. Eh, they weren't always showing up at this time. I don't actually think this one had one. Oh, well. What are you gonna do? I think that's it for this, uh, this book. Unless you wanna look at the Subway uh, Kids Pack ad. All right, well, well that, was a, that was a good show. We looked at some interesting comic books today. That's fun. A bit Superman heavy, but, uh, you know, everyone loves Superman. All right, um, check out the Patreon if you like this show, if you want to support me and see me do more of it. Uh, that's where I'd recommend you go. I got tons of stuff to download there. If you like my daily comic book reviews on TikTok and Instagram, uh, that's also where you show your support. I do weekly, more or less weekly reviews, essays, something rather, usually up of mine on the front page of the journal. Uh, just last week, I had a big piece out on Joe Casey. Uh, what else? Got a podcast with Claire Napier. It's called Utter Madness. We talk about Top Cow Comics. That's uh, Witchblade, Michael Turner, Mike Sylvester. Mark Silvestri. I've been doing this spiel for how many shows? Uh, maybe that's it. I've said it too many times. Uh, anyway, we also got videos up here on uh, YouTube. Check them out. What else? Uh, I can't think of anything. Have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. Take care of the world. Be kind to animals, small children. Uh, just, if you need to go get a drink of water, Go treat yourself to a nice, cool drink of water. Take your pills if you need to. I shouldn't be the one who has to tell you to do that.